Thanks. And Jim and I go way back, so he could probably introduce me as well as anybody. Uh, well, thanks for having me. I'm going to um, talk about a, a whole host of issues. In fact, I'm going to try to distill a 400-page text into 10 minutes. Uh, I think I can do that. I will do that. Um, just suffice it to say, this is a book that I'd worked on uh, for many years after uh, time spent in Mississippi leading their recovery efforts for about two and a half years and was trying to distill the issues of recovery for a staff I hired that knew nothing about disaster recovery and trying to train them as quickly as possible. And so uh, the intent of the book and the intent of this discussion is really to think about um, what we understand uh, in terms of uh, theory, uh, what we understand about practice and really how those two, uh, two themes uh, can connect uh, relative to disaster recovery. So I'm going to talk about several things. One, I'm going to talk about uh, what I would call the Disaster Recovery Assistance Network. Uh, in the context of that, I'll talk about that network, which is really uh, very loosely defined. Uh, it also differs over time and space. And all of these issues I'll be talking about, in fact, to be honest with you, is a very critical um, evaluation of our national uh, recovery uh, network, if you will. And I'll offer um, some uh, possible solutions. Uh, that network that I'll describe uh, tends to deliver three types of resources. Um, uh, both the speakers have talked about them to some extent, but I, I'm going to talk about three. Uh, one is funding, and that often uh, drives much of recovery. And in fact, I'll even argue that um, uh, recovery drive or funding drives the recovery trajectory in ways that uh, are unsustainable, unresilient, uh, and lead to uh, perpetuating future disasters. Uh, another important resource that we often don't um, consider a resource are policies. And I'll talk about those across this larger network. Uh, policies that are created by everybody from, in theory, the individual all the way to the uh, international uh, arena. And then a third resource I'll talk about is technical assistance and the delivery of that technical assistance and how it shapes recovery outcomes. So three of the dimensions of that framework I'll talk about are, if you will, the rules associated with those resources and the degree to which they address local needs. I'll talk about the timing of assistance. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about uh, horizontal and vertical integration, and, and I'll explain each of those uh, briefly. And then finally, what I'll, I'll look to do is wrap up by describing lessons for the uh, community public health, medical, and social services. And I would say, as you're looking and observing uh, some of my comments and some of the, the graphics I show, I would encourage you to think about them in the context of, of public health, medical, and social services. So if you think about this larger disaster recovery assistance network, and so on the vertical axes uh, is a set of resource rules across those three resources, funding, policy, and technical assistance. I still view that as a very critical element. Uh, and then on the, on the uh, horizontal axis is understanding of local needs. And I should say this network or this graphic is a hypothetical representation. And it could, uh, this may not represent a particular disaster, it could. Uh, but also those nodes, if you will, could be shifted, could be moved over time down this uh, kind of this um, diagonal axis. And really the intent of this graphic is to show that, for example, nations uh, that do provide assistance in major disasters often have highly prescriptive rules uh, associated with the resources that they deliver. And on the flip side, they often have a very poor understanding of local needs and conditions. Uh, so, I mean, that all makes sense intuitively. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is the individual. Uh, that individual that has experienced disaster. They often have intense, very deep understanding of local needs and conditions, what we often refer to as indigenous knowledge, uh, yet they often, and often the rules, if you will, that they create may be quite flexible. Uh, one of the fundamental challenges we face is that the recovery programs and policies that we've created in this country uh, often don't engage the individual. They often don't engage nonprofits and so forth uh, in the, the development of policies and programs that, that should better address local needs. Within the middle, if you will, this large, what I would call a zone of uncertainty, these are groups and organizations that, to be honest with you, we know less about. We tend to overstudy the federal government and often focus on individuals and sometimes nonprofits and so forth. But for example, we often don't talk a lot about the media's role uh, in spreading misinformation uh, and doing an actual disservice uh, following disaster, uh, or special districts or community development organizations that often reach out and assist the, the most needy. And so this is a fundamental challenge that we face is how do we change, if you will, the makeup of this. And, I, and, I will show, and I'll go back to this in time to show how planning can uh, modify this system. Just wanting a couple of examples related to the medical field. If you think about other nations, post-Katrina, an example, a pretty um, stark example, is uh, a, a whole host of Cuban physicians were willing and ready to come into the U.S. And actually, we didn't have it. We still don't, frankly, have a good protocol to accept international aid. And a national policy, if you will, stated publicly was when you overthrow Castro, we will allow the physicians in. 
And that, and that sounds actually ridiculous, but that is actually the, the public record. Uh, and that was a comment made by the White House. I mean, these are issues that to me are just, are, um, are, are pretty shocking, really, and I think we can do a lot better than that. Uh, another issue, so this is the rules and understanding of local needs. The second dimension is the timing of assistance. This is a, uh, a, a graphic that's been used for many, many years. Uh, many people, in fact, FEMA still utilize it. Um, I would argue it's outdated. It's a simplified representation of reality. It assumes that disaster recovery is very much a linear process. There is some truth to it in the sense that you do search and rescue before you rebuild communities. Uh, you pick up the debris, or as they call rubble, before you do certain other things. However, what this implies is that recovery is very linear, and it implies a uniform recovery across communities. And, and to be honest with you, that it, um, in many ways, and it was described by many of the, community, many of the speakers, is uh, recovery does not happen at the same speed. Uh, some people never recover from disaster, uh, particularly those that are the most uh, socially vulnerable and marginalized. So th what I'm interested in thinking about is the timing of assistance as delivered by these organizations. And again, I should even say within this graphic, just think about that one node It says federal government. Think about the complexity of that and all of the players there. So they all have different rules. They all have different policies. They all deliver resources at different points in time. I'll give one example of how, to me, what's important for us to understand is this, the timing of the delivery of assistance. Uh, Rob, I think, alluded to this, and I'll give one pretty stark example if you think about this in the context of timing. Uh, after uh, Katrina uh, in Mississippi, uh, uh, a 30-foot storm surge destroyed 50,000 homes on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, the nonprofit community, uh, which is often viewed as, as um, kind of the savior, if you will, in recovery, and the federal government is often viewed as, as overly bureaucratic, in many ways that, that can be a problem in the sense that uh, what happened in, in a number of communities is the nonprofits were going into communities rebuilding destroyed neighborhoods, including those among the most vulnerable, very quickly, and they could do that. They were more nimble. They could deliver their resources more quickly than the federal government. However, they were rebuilding many of those homes, hundreds of those homes, for their prevent condition on the ground, in essence, in an area that had received a 30-foot storm surge. So what they were doing is perpetuating social vulnerability, the very thing that many social justice groups and others are trying to uh, not to deal with or trying to uh, eliminate. Uh, if, in fact, through good planning, and again, theoretically, if they coordinated their resources with the federal government, they may have paid to elevate the new construction, the nonprofit builds the home, uh, you've got a safe and sanitary home that's elevated or perhaps built um, out of harm's way. So that's one example using two players, if you will, on this network. And when you start to think about all of those players, imagine the complexity. And it shouldn't surprise us if we don't do good pre-event planning that this is a, a natural outcome, perpetuating vulnerability, uh, those in positions of power are making the, the bulk of the decisions. Uh, recovery is laborious, and it's not well coordinated. So the third dimension that I talk about in the book is, uh, is a common uh, description in planning. Uh, Phil Burke, Jack Cortez, Dennis Wenger uh, developed, actually applied this to recovery in 1993, and it still is particularly relevant. Uh, and it's fairly basic. It's a, it's a good, to me, it's a pretty elegant way of describing uh, the coordination issue uh, in, at the community level in disaster recovery. So if you think about this notion of horizontal and vertical integration, so horizontal integration, going back to that network diagram, are those players that you find at the community level. It could be a social justice group. It could be a group that emerges after disaster. It could be local government officials and so forth. That's at that local level, the horizontal integration. The vertical integration, as the name implies, is local, state, federal. I've made the argument in the book that we also ought to add the international community. And so if you have strong horizontal and vertical integration, recovery outcomes tend to be better. Uh, it's not surprising. However, what we find in many communities, uh, take an example, uh, a small rural community may have very strong horizontal integration, tight-knit community that has a long history of working well together, perhaps. However, they may be somewhat isolated from their interactions with state government, federal government, particularly the international arena. And if, in fact, you don't have those connectivity across both dimensions, uh, your recovery can suffer. Uh, for example, they may not be as attuned to how to reach out to the federal government or how to reach out to FEMA and other organizations to more clearly uh, uh, describe their local needs. They may know what their needs are very well, but they may not be very attuned or adept at reaching out to those players. Similarly, if you have a good understanding of, through vertical integration uh, but poor horizontal integration, you may understand uh, reaching out to the federal government and to the state government for recovery assistance, but if you don't have that good uh, horizontal uh, integration, your recovery may be driven disproportionately by the very narrowly defined federal grant programs that I described earlier. 
So again, if you have one but not the other, you can have uh, negative outcomes. Important thing is all of these dimensions, the understanding of local needs, the timing of assistance and horizontal integration certainly can be improved uh, through planning. And one of the things that I will allude to is in this graphic is just to, to um, explain, if you will, how planning can address uh, the, the challenges in this graphic. If you visualize the horizontal uh, line, if you will, being stood up, if you will, uh, in practice uh, through good planning. You, at least in theory, what you're saying is all of those players have a better understanding of what those local needs are. They may still have uh, programs and policies that may be highly prescriptive or that may be uh, more or less prescriptive, but standing it up, at least all the players understand what those needs are. And in theory, through good planning, that's the start. But the second, if you will, time series is ideally those programs and policies are modified. In fact, I think, Reed, you talked about this issue of how can't we just change the rules, the rules of the game, if you will. Uh, and I think that's something that we re really need to think about. Some, some organizations are more attuned and willing and more nimble to change. Some of them are guided to some extent by federal programs. But I will say, in fact, this was alluded to earlier by one of the earlier speakers, federal programs can be changed and they're routinely changed after disaster if, in fact, you have access to good data and or political power. Uh, and you often, to be honest with you, these narrowly defined programs can be changed through negotiations with those federal agencies, depending if, in fact, you understand how to navigate that system. But that also goes to that understanding of vertical integration, which many communities often don't have. And I have been a part of disaster recovery efforts where it does take uh, the governor interacting with the president of the United States to change federal policy, but it does happen. A lot of states don't even realize that that is uh, not that uncommon. Uh, but it is a reality uh, in practice. So a couple of lessons for uh, community public health, uh, medical and social services. Uh, certainly Jim and Rob alluded to this, is the value of pre-event planning for post-disaster recovery. Those three dimensions I talked about, all of them can be addressed by good pre-event planning. Uh, the idea of coalition building and reaching out to non-traditional partners. Uh, the social justice groups, for example, may or may not work uh, routinely with um, local emergency managers. or. Local emergency managers may not work with land use planners. In fact, that's often the case, and empirical evidence shows that uh, communities that do a better job of integrating or interacting between local emergency managers and land use planners tend to have better recoveries. Uh, the idea of pre-event planning can change this notion of horizontal and vertical integration. You can change both dimensions uh, through planning, and that has been shown through numerous studies. Uh, and how do you, and, and actually through planning, planning is not just simply creating a plan. One of the real strengths of planning is going through the process and engaging in meaningful deliberation and debate and coming up with a collaboratively designed uh, solution for complex problems like, uh, like disaster recovery. Uh, planning also helps us better coordinate resources, the three types I alluded to, funding, policy, and technical assistance. It is actually every disaster, it doesn't surprise me anymore, but every disaster, these funding streams delivered by all these players are often uncoordinated. They remain uncoordinated. They remain uncoordinated across federal agencies and in fact, they remain uncoordinated within federal agencies. Policies and programs that run counter to one another are being administered by the same very agency. Uh, one example being the public assistance program uh, versus the hazard mitigation grant program. Public assistance tends to be the bulk of the funding that comes from FEMA after disaster and it's rebuilding damaged infrastructure. It's typically rebuilt to pre-event conditions, perpetuating a future disaster, whereas the hazard mitigation grant program while only 15% of total disaster costs is used to, to uh, retrofit public facilities, to move properties out of the floodplain and so forth. Post-disaster recovery planning, Jim alluded to this too, the, the idea and post-disaster recovery planning can happen and does happen, and in fact, uh, Jim also mentioned this, very few local governments have recovery plans in place today, even though the National Disaster Recovery Framework uh, was required by Congress after Katrina. Some of my research shows that most states don't have an effective recovery plan in place. In fact, most state plans, quote unquote, aren't plans at all. They're pr predominantly a list of federal grant programs that they should implement after disaster. That's not a plan. That's a list of federal agency programs, which goes back to one of my original comments, which is the unfortunate reality is these nearly defined federal programs can drive the trajectory of recovery in, in disproportionate ways, and often not meeting local needs. And then finally, the, the idea uh, uh, maybe in closing is perhaps a, a positive spin on what I've, I would argue is a, a pretty negative or a critical review of the, of the current system we have is really engaging uh, in the national disaster recovery framework. This is something that has evolved. It's still evolving. They're starting to implement it and, and roll it out um, uh, across the country. 
Uh, there's a long way to go. Um, it wasn't that long ago that there was no discussion about long-term disaster recovery. Now there's a framework that's emerging, but it still uh, is very focused on federal grant programs, and there really needs to be an effort, I think, by, by bodies like this uh, and practitioners around the U.S. to really try to operationalize uh, a national recovery framework that addresses many of the fundamental weaknesses that, uh, that I've described. Thank you. Well, man, I'm